imagine for a moment if your country was ruled by Oliver Cromwell with the racial policies of apartheid South Africa in the 1970s, where Methodists, Methodist preachers are arrested and tried for heresy, where Presbyterian ruling elders roam the streets to inspect women's attire for proprietary, where armed guards are posted at the exits of churches on Sunday to prevent anyone in the congregation from leaving before the final benediction. You know, a place where the the only restaurants permitted are Chick-fil-A and Famous Dave's Barbecue. If you can imagine that, then you can imagine the world that Stephen Wolfe would like to create in his book, The Case for Christian Nationalism. Uh, that's, that's kind of what the book argues for. It's not simply arguing for a close relationship between church and state. It's arguing for a type of Christianity that is above all uh, in place to focus on the hegemony of white people. So it is a, a, a version of white Christian nationalism, and I regard it as both deviant, heretical, and pernicious in the extreme. And people might say, well, Mike, you know, if the book is really that bad, why bother reviewing it or responding to it? I mean, you, 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 you're just going to, you're just going to, you know, keep feeding the frenzy about Christian nationalism and, and give him more airtime than this book deserves. Well, I'm, I'm doing a critique, a lengthy and concerted critique for a few reasons, okay? First of all, uh, according to YouTube, Wolf's videos where he talks about the book, where he advocates the case for Christian nationalism, uh, these videos get on average between 20 to 45,000 views at a time. Uh, so this is garnering a bit of attention, both in America and around the world. Uh, he is advocating the case for a, a particular type of white Protestant nationalism. And I think this is in, in, in infecting people and people may be influenced by this. So I think it is important to put out a thoughtful critique out there as a kind of response to, to his version or his variety of Christian nationalism. The second thing we've got to remember is that Christian nationalism is a threat to liberal democracy, okay? It's a threat to Orthodox Christianity. It's a threat to evangelical Christianity, both in America and in other parts of the world. Christian nationalism is not just limited to the United States. There are expressions of it in other parts of the world, okay? So I think we do have to take this seriously because there are people who want to implement this kind of a vision, which would require, would require a very series of anti-democratic measures being put into place. And the third reason I want to uh, offer my own critique is that, sadly, uh, a number of journalists and commentators who critique Christian nationalism are, to be frank, historically and religiously illiterate. And sometimes you get the impression that almost anyone who is Christian and politically conservative gets counted as a Christian nationalism. Now, now, that's not the case, okay? Just because you're conservative and a Christian, that, that does not a Christian nationalist make. So if we're going to do a critique, we've got to do it from someone and for people uh, who need to learn what Christian nationalism really is, rather than just saying, you know, saying, hey, that guy has got a Bible on his desk. He must be a Christian nationalist. No, we need a real thoughtful critique of Christian nationalism yeah, in order to wear off what I think are its uh, dangerous impulses and its very real threat to uh, Western democracies. It's also a threat to, I think, Christian witness in those democracies. So that's what I'm going to be about in this video. And I have to warn you, this is going to be a long video. So I, I think we're going to have to hunker down for a good 40 or 50 minutes. But this is this is going to be long. But stay with me because all of the critiques I have to make uh, I think are very important. They expose real uh, elements of the book and its vision for America and for Christianity, which I think you'll find alarming. But stay tuned and you'll, you'll come across some scary stuff and you'll see and understand why I'm offering this rather impassioned response that I'm making. So that's what I'm going to do. However, the place for us to begin with is surprisingly uh, a, a somewhat of a sympathetic approach to what he's doing. Um, you know, I, I want to show that I'm doing a fair and honest critique. You know, I'm not some ultra left wing tree hugging 
liberal from Yale who's just throwing rocks because some Christian wants to have a voice in politics. I want to show that I can really understand and appreciate the book and even affirm elements of the book. So I'm going to kick off with a few things in the book that I, I actually think are right. And then I'm going to go into the, the critique where I'll really bring the wrath and flund, uh, thunder. So th this is what I like about the book. Let me explain what I like about it. Um, Wolf is correct that it's okay. It's, it's good, natural and normal to love your people and your place. Okay. Wolf wants to be able to love the people in his street, in his suburb, in his church, county, state, and country without being made to feel like he is a rustic rube. Okay. Nobody should feel guilty because not all of their family and friends look like a picture perfect shop for a diversity, equity, and inclusion seminar. Okay. He, he just wants to love the people who are in his own hometown, even if a lot of them are like him. He wants to say it's okay to love your Alamada, to be patriotic, and to be devoted to your own family. Okay. And not everyone has to be a cosmopolitan. Not all of us live in a multicultural metropolis. It's okay to be a, to be a town in a, a person in a small town where 80% of the people are just like you. Okay. You know, I can get that. I understand that. Uh, the second thing I would uh, affirm about the book is that religion does have a place in the public square. Wolf opines and wants to resist an aggressive secularism that seeks to drive religion away from our civic discourse. And it wants to often deconstruct permanent fixtures of human existence like uh, you know, community, family, church, and the like. Uh, and, and I share, I share that critique of a kind of uh, progressive Orwellianism that aspires to replace the equality principle of our liberal democracies and, and replace that with a hierarchy of moral identities that divides everyone into the c categories of the oppressor or the oppressed. You know, I think our Christian heritage in Western societies is a good thing. Uh, and all things being equal, uh, Christianity has been a force for immense good. And we should we should remember that. We should uh, be proud of that heritage and resist those who seek to replace it either with a caliphate or with, with communism. So I'm, I'm on board with that kind of critique of the postmodern left. Third, I understand that Wolf is also responding to progressive elites with their condescending contempt for the uh, white rural working class. Uh, yeah, because I, I have a working class background myself and, and I've always been a fan of books like Paul Embury's Despised, Why the Modern Left Loathes the Working Class, or in fact, two, two books on a similar theme have recently just come out in the US. There's Bata Unga Sargon's book, Second Class, how the elites betrayed America's working men and women, and also Rob Henderson's book, Troubled, where he talks about how luxury beliefs of the elites, which can, can confer status on the upper class while ruining the lives of the lower classes. So, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm up for that, you know, uh, I'm up for a crit critique of the upper middle class progressives and their glaring contempt for the pieties and pastimes of the working class. Fourth, I'll also say in Wolf's favor, there is a strand of Protestant tradition that seeks reform, not only of religion and morals, but of the state as well. So for instance, Calvinism cannot be reduced to predestination or the you know, banal abbreviation TULIP, you know, it's a theological system. Uh, read book four of Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is basically a manual on how to run a Protestant city. I mean, even the Westminster Confession of Faith has sections uh, on civil order for a Christian society. Uh, the Reformed tradition often imagined a city or a country governed by a synergy of counselors and clergy to keep the place authentically Christian. Uh, Wolf wants to recover that tradition and uh, apply it af afresh today. And his views are not completely out of sync with some aspects of the Reformed tradition. Fifth, I would also agree with Wolf against some Anabaptist perspectives that Christians can participate in and contribute to the political order. They can do that by voting, by serving in office or working for the government. 
The vocation of public services uh, is a way of contributing to the common good, a, a way to offer Christian witness, and I think God wants this world to be wisely governed. In that sense, uh, you know, we are recovering our Adamic vocation to be the stewards of creation, and we're exercising our Christian vocation to bring heavenly love and light to bear on earthly institutions. So those are the things that I think Wolf gets right, or I can agree and support. But on the whole, I regard his vision for Christianity in the world as a grotesque perversion of Christianity. It's xenophobic, prone to violence, I mean, almost cartoonish in its aspirations to take over America. Wolf envisages a Cicero Papist state headed by a strongman Christian prince who rules through the apparatus of a Presbyterian Taliban, who I would imagine to be bald bearded men with thick glasses who like cigars, submissive wives, heresy trials, and reading Protestant scholastics in the original Dutch. You know, a, a fantasy world from the same sort of people who created the Geneva Commons Facebook group, if you know anything about them. So, uh, yeah, there's a little bit of rhetoric in my description of, of Wolf's and his view of Christian nationalism, uh, but only a little bit. I'm really riffing off, um, riffing off what he says rather than imputing foreign notions to him. So let's let's get into the critique. Uh, when it comes to the the critical response to Wolf, my biggest gripe is that Wolf complains that Christianity has become servile, effeminate, and powerless. He says that Christians take pleasure in their oppression, and Christianity is often used as a coping device for an action, even when under tyranny and slavery. It is a theological means to psychologically endure one's Gnostic unwillingness to struggle against earthly abuse. At its worst, Theology is to be wielded to find pleasure in one's humiliation. Well, I mean, harsh words. He's incensed that Christians have been excluded from uh, public institutions. Uh, they've been forced to affirm the language of universal dignity, tolerance, human rights, anti-nationalism, anti-nativism, social justice, and equality. I mean, they've been forced to affirm things like justice and equality. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly terrible for him. Um, he protests that Christianity has been ousted from its Constantinian heights, been cast out of the public square, and it lacks the courage to seize the throne back. And it's been forced to tolerate people that he seems to regard as intolerable. In response to that, I want to point out that servile, effeminate, and powerless is what Christians were proudly known for. Uh, remember this, to be crucified was to be made powerless it was to be pierced which 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 had sexual connotations okay the romans always portrayed the victims of their conquest as womanish dominated and violated by their roman superiors to be crucified was to be made feminine and far from shrinking away from that notion shying away from it being embarrassed about it Christians embraced the cross and, and all that symbolized in the Greco-Roman world, they embraced that as the locus of their identity, the source of their mission, despite all the negative connotations it had. You know, what the Christians cherished was not power in power, it was power in weakness, greatness in civility, honor in humiliation, equality in Christ, love conquers hate, better to be abused than to abuse others. Uh, the very values of tolerance, justice, and equality that Wolf despises are products of the Christian tradition that have fermented and flourished and developed into the West in their current form. We should not be despising those values, but pointing out their Christian roots. Let me add, too, that one of the reasons that the Romans despised Christianity is because it was a religion of the stulti, of the foolish, of the nobodies, the weak, the lowly, the impoverished, the unmanly, those lacking status and power. You know, the pagan philosopher Celsus in the late second century, he derided Christianity as full of foolish and lowly persons, insufferably obtuse, full of slaves, women, and children. I mean, that's what Celsus hated about Christianity. It was the religion of the losers. 
And I think Wolf would agree with Kelsus. Uh, he thinks Kelsus was right. Instead of being the religion of women, slaves, and children, Christianity should be the religion of senators and gladiators. It should be masculine, mighty, and magnificent. And this is the irony. What Wolf finds so utterly appalling about modern Christianity is how much it resembles ancient Christianity with its belief that God is on the side of the poor, the oppressed, and the disempowered. Okay, so that's that's my first critique of, of Wolf's view. Uh, he critiques modern Christianity for being too much like ancient Christianity. My second critique of Wolf comes down to this point. Wolf is explicitly and perniciously kinist in his account of a Christian nation. Uh, th this is the real dark element of the book, if you ask me. It, it really is talking about uh, keeping white people uh, in charge of America and, and segregating and disempowering all ethnic minorities. For Wolf, uh, nation and ethnicity are synonyms, you know, at, at least in, in his prescription as to what a nation should be, and that's you know, an, an, an ethnically homogenous group. For him, a nation is a, is a Volk, it's a German word, uh, to describe a like-minded and, and people who look alike, they speak a common tongue, they have a history of exchange with each other. And for Wolf, solidarity needs similarity, which requires the exclusion of an outgroup out group in order to fulfill a natural right to be different from other groups. That, now listen to those words. That's very important for him, that everyone has a natural right to be different to other groups. And he is also open to amicable and mutual alliances with other, other ethnic groups, but he doesn't want things like adoption, inclusion, or even acculturation um, of different cultures, you know, intermingling with each other. Uh, he doesn't want to rescind the citizenship of ethnic minorities, but what he wants is, and this is his words now, an amicable ethnic separation along political lines, which sounds either like segregation or the resettlement of some ethnic groups abroad, like sending blacks to Liberia in Africa. He's clear on one thing. He says, non-Christians might be entitled to justice, peace, and safety, but they are not entitled to political equality. Now, that's, that's not Christian. That sounds like the Islamic concept of dimitude, where, where infidels, you know, non-Muslims, are treated as second-class citizens. And, and then he sounds like a villain in a, in a Marvel movie where he says, the Christian's posture towards the earth ought to be that it is ours, not theirs for we are co-heirs with Christ. I mean, that's some serious rhetoric he's got going on there. And what is more for Wolf, the bonds between people in his Christian nation are not creedal. He explicitly rejects that. In, instead, he, the bonds between people are primarily ethnogeographic. He says the natural inclination to dwell among similar people is good and necessary. Uh, his point is that civil unity cannot be built on a spiritual unity, but rather it needs to include a common language and cultural similarity. You know, the mere confession that Jesus is Lord can unite people of a Christian nation, but for Wolf, it's too abstract to be the basis for a civil society. Spiritual truth for Wolf is superseded by love for one's own. So rather than love of God and love of neighbor, what is paramount for Wolf? is love of one's own people, love of one's own kind of people. Wolf doesn't think that a spiritual unity in Christ warrants a civic and local union, as he warns, cultural diversity harms civil unity. Uh, he, he also rejects any idea of immigration, not only from, you know, culturally alien nations, uh, but even from from fellow white Christian nations. I mean, one of the, one of the weirdest parts of the book is where Wolf argues that during the Reformation, the reformed cities of Europe should not have received fellow Protestant refugees such as the French Huguenots or the Marian exiles from Britain because of problems of overcrowding. Uh, so he really does not believe in any immigration. Um, I think this is also his way of saying not only does he not want African 
and Latino Christians coming. He doesn't even want white Christians coming to his country. And th- this is this is a bit weird. If I can make a contrast between him and the Hungarian uh, 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 Prime Minister Viktor Orban, and Orban is a quasi Christian Christian nationalist. I think it's a little bit murky or or obscure, but. Even Orban was happy to receive Syrian immigrants, um, you know, refugees from Syria, if they were Christian. So even Orban is open up to a, a confessional unity with different ethnic groups. But Wolf clearly disagrees with Orban on this point. Uh, Wolf's claim is that it's natural to love the familiar rather than the foreign. So that's so true, I would say, but um, only for people who have never read the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know, <laughs> where it's all about loving people who are other than you, you know, of a different ethnicity, of a of, of a different religious group, uh, in fact. Uh, or it's only true for people who have never read about the unity of the church in Antioch, where Jews and, and Greeks were united together by their faith in Jesus. Uh, yeah, I'd also add that, you know, Moses married an Ethiopian woman, and the last time I checked, Ethiopians were black, okay? The gospel, the Christian gospel, has always compelled people to break down ethno-racial barriers, which is why Jesus does his feeding miracle in the gospels. He, he does on one side on the Jewish side, and he does one another miracle on the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee. You know, Peter, in the book of Acts, Peter dared to go into the house of a Gentile centurion and break bread with him, even though people said, Peter, how could you go into the house of a Gentile and eat with him? Uh, The Apostle Paul says that the ethnic class and gender divisions that separate people and were tools for hierarchy and oppression, they are broken down by the cross. They are broken down in Christ. Uh, In the book of Acts, Paul's sermon at the Areopagus, celebrated how, in in the old King James language, God hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Uh, Now that verse, you know, Acts 17, 26, from one blood God had made all the the men on the the earth, that was the go-to verse for abolitionists. That was the verse they always preached and taught, that all human beings by common grace are connected by one blood. The other thing I would say about Wolf's view is that no ethnic group is completely static and insulated. No one is is completely immune from being shaped by other ethnic groups or, or by external influence. All cultures and groups are hybridizing in some way. I mean, all of us move around the state, the nation, the world, interacting with other people, often marrying people from other countries as well. You know, imagine imagine a, a good all-American boy, captain of the football team, joins the army, you know, gets stationed in Germany for a while, and while he's there, he meets a nice Turkish Pentecostal girl. While he's there, uh, they get married, he moves back to Idaho, they open a Turkish coffee house while he resettles into civilian life as a computer programmer. Uh, Their kids are a wonderful mix of Turkish American and German cultures, and they represent an amalgam uh, of of what has been brought together. Now to that, I say, well, you know, hallelujah, God be be praised, where I think uh, Stephen Wolf would say, oh, hell no. But his basis for rejecting it um, is largely because he wants to protect, retain the particulars of kin and custom. It's all about protecting the the ethnic group, the race, from the impurity of followers. Now, unless you're going to live in some kind of fortress, moat, or dare I say prison, um, or a concentration camp, you know, all of us, you know, in the world are going to be influenced influenced by interacting with, falling in love with people of different ethnic groups, people of different cultures all around the world. You know, and and I could understand if his concern was open borders and mass migration. If that was his concern, I could I could understand. But he's really interested in maintaining a type of ethnic and racial purity. Okay, and that is really disturbing stuff. He he's also got this 
strange psychologizing, uh, psychologizing of the political left as having a suicidal need to self-abuse and disinherit itself because of white guilt. Uh, stuff like that, he says, I think is verging into unhinged territory. Uh, there's no doubt that Wolf here is riding with a, a sense of prejudice towards foreigners and ethnic others. And he's got a strong desire to maintain the purity of his kin and wants to keep them unadulterated from contact with foreigners and foreign customs. So uh, this is a guy who I think would be a big no to interracial marriages. Now, he's aware of the charge of ethno-narcissism, but I would go beyond that. I would say it's more like a form of white supremacy, aiming to keep white people separated from and supreme over other ethnic groups that they are in, in proximity to. Now, that from my mind is really sad uh, because Wolf's Christianity, uh, far from restraining or curing his ethnic prejudice, as it's done for so many, is turned instead into an instrument for amplifying his prejudices. And that's probably the, the saddest aspect of the book. Third, Wolf proposes a pan-Protestant alliance to be the theological basis for his white Christian nation. Wolf himself is explicitly Presbyterian. I mean, like hardcore Presbyterian. I'm talking like haggis and bagpipes and, and stuff. But he is open to co-belligerence with other Protestants. In some cases, even Baptists. Um, that said, Wolf is deeply suspicious of Baptists because of their tradition of dissent and advocacy for near absolute religious liberty, which is you know, an anathema to him. He repudiates uh, neo-anabaptists for subverting the durable Christian order. Uh, accordingly, he says, pedo baptists would be the most stabilizing force in a pan-Protestant political community, which for him, I think uh, he means in his Christian nation, Presbyterians will be first among equals and in practice, probably more equal than others. Wolf's Christian nationalism uh, says that the state is to direct people towards the true Christian religion. But which Christian denomination's definition of true religion gets to be hegemonic? Should it be the Southern Baptist Convention, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church of America, Presbyterian Church USA? I mean, he, he, and he never mentions the Greek Orthodox or Catholics who seem to be just persona non grata. Um, they either are, are banned or perhaps are in you know, theological re-education camp in his Christian America. Um, I get the feeling that Wolf would not want Anglicans forcing him to worship only using the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. But if Anglicans were in the ascendancy, his theology of the magistrate and the state would give us no reason not to do it. Uh, now, which is ironic because that's the very reason why many Congregationalist Baptists and Anglicans fled England for the Americas to get away from Anglican Christian nationalism. But that's by the by. Uh, Wolf also thinks that magistrates and municipal leaders will be theologically trained, be able to decide matters of public order and solve theological disputes without infringing on the spiritual authority of ministers of religion. The, the prince, the king, the, the great Christian leader and the magistrate can also fund the ministry of the word and theological education. They can call synods to resolve disputes and they can moderate proceedings themselves. They can also impose a uniformity of worship and force the mandatory attendance at church. Uh, such civic leaders, uh, Wolf believes, will know with due prudence what are the essential and non-essential elements in their pan-Protestant political community. Now, Wolf straddles many peculiar and er erratic inconsistencies in his thought. I mean, in the same paragraph, I mean, he says this, he says that the prince or magistrate cannot force people to receive the Lord's Supper while kneeling because, you know, it's not mandated in scripture. But the prince or magistrate can insist on the elevation of the pulpit above the Lord's table. Uh, in a church, even though that's not stipulated in scripture too. So sometimes he wants Christian liberty or he can't force people to kneel, but other things that is Presbyterian tradition value, well, yeah, they, they can be enforced by the magistrate. Uh, but this presages for my mind, 
the legal and ecclesiastical chaos that would ensue if his version of Christian nationalism was ever going to be put into effect. Um, and consider this too, this too. Presbyterian church governance is highly litigious. So there would be constant suits brought against people with allegations about things pertaining to, you know, six-day creationism, you know, pedo communion, preterism, postmillennialism, theonomy, you know, watching watching Netflix on the Sabbath and, and, and someone who's confused law and gospel. Now, in, in that type of litigious in a background or context where the magistrate's then solving all of these theological disputes, the danger is orthodoxy, you know, would either be stringently narrowed or else it would be defined so broadly as to make heresy practically impossible. Um, that's why I believe that in a religiously diverse state, and even if that diversity is only intra-Protestant, uh, the state must consider itself neutral in religious affairs and incompetent to adjudicate on religious disputes. Otherwise, it's heresy trials as far as the eye can see. And, and the, the comic irony here is if this sort of, you know, Presbyterian Christian nation was ever set up, if it was ever, if it was ever practiced, then Presbyterians and the OPC and the PCA would probably put, you know, Douglas Wilson and Stephen Wolfe on trial for heresy. I mean, this is the hilarious thing. Um, if, 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 if this vision of a Christian nation with its Presbyterian system of government was ever put into effect, I, I think Stephen Wolfe himself would be tried for heresy because of his sympathies with um, theonomy or, or maybe for views on things like pedo communion. And uh, that, that, would, that would be, in a sense, comic because it would prove the point that all revolutions eat their own children. Uh, and and that, that's why I, 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 I can't really take it seriously. But here's the other danger. Re recall this. A state that can impose orthodoxy can also impose heresy. I mean, I think Wolf himself proves it. I mean, he's grieved that America is dominated by a regime-enforced moral ideology as the standard of moral respectability. I mean, he grieves that this morality is being imposed. Now, I agree. I think government trying to impose its, its own moral vision on people of faith, I, I think that is a bad thing. But the solution is not a brutal and repressive Christian regime which can enforce its own values. The solution instead is to limit the moral authority and coercive powers of any government. It's not like, well, let's just be the guys who are in control so no one can control us. No, what, what we need is a separation of powers, a separation of church and state in a healthy way so the government cannot run roughshed over, over the religious convictions of the faithful. Uh, Wolf forgets, too, that the first American uh, colonists were fleeing the Christian nationalism of England with its you know, Anglican autocracy, uh, and they wanted to find a fertile soil for religious freedom. Uh, Wolf fails to recall that the separation of church and state was intended to protect one group of Christians from another group of Christians. I mean, that's the basis. That's the basis for the separation of church and state. That's the basis for not, not letting government dictate to people's consciences what their religious convictions should be. Alarming, too, is Wolf's account of the Christian prince in his Christian nationalism. And the way he describes it is it, it sounds like a job description for Donald Trump. He rejects administrative wonks and regulators and instead um, hails the prince as uh, the first of his people, father or protector of the country, which, which sounds kind of like a cross between Augustus and, and Cromwell put in a blender. I mean, this, this is what he writes. He says, I'm not calling for a monarchical regime over every civil polity and certainly not an autocracy, though I envision a measured and theocratic Caesarism. The prince is a world shaker for our time, who brings a Christian people to self-consciousness and who, in his rise, restores their will for their good. 
such a figure like that for Wolf is a mediator of God. We see the image of God in the prince, who is a kind of, you know, national God in the tradition of Psalm 45. Uh, he's not the head of the church, but his rule has a spiritual quality about it, while careful not to usurp the spiritual role as a mediator of grace or the role of the clergy in the administration of the sacraments. Uh, the principal task of such a Christian prince, says Wolf, is to dismantle the gynocracy with its obsession about, you know, equality and, and, and vic victimhood, as well as wimpy notions of therapy and self-care. And it should be replaced with what Wolf seems to describe as a Spartan sense of masculinity, married to a Nietzschean mode of will to power or scaffolded along a hierarchy of nature. Uh, but if you believe in total depravity, as I do, then you know that a, a prince armed with the rhetoric of divine office and without checks and balances on his power can go very, very bad. I mean, really, really bad. This is why the Virginian state motto is Sic Semper Tyrannus, always stick it to the tyrant. So uh, God bless the people of Virginia and may they never have a tyrant who rules over them. Uh, I have no doubt that Wolf's pan-Protestant apparatus would very quickly either begin to fray into civil conflict over something like, you know, pedo communion, or else it would lead to a single tyrant imposing a single form on, on everyone else and doing it through violence. I mean, that's where I think it would lead in the end, because that's where it's led other times when it's been attempted. Fourth, Wolf does not believe in, engage with, or even acknowledge the liberal political tradition. Uh, in other words, uh, Wolf doesn't understand why things like Cromwell's England, Calvin's Geneva, John Knox's Scotland, or Hendrik Vivard's South Africa, hope I pronounced that right, why they were so quickly abandoned and, and, and now remembered with a sense of re revulsion. Uh, a Christian state operated or run by a symphony of magistrate and ministers of religion did not last long when it was practiced. Why? Because it sucked. It sucked because it ran over people's liberties. Also, rather than fight each other over religious differences, people preferred a state that was neutral on religious matters, you know, a, a degree of religious freedom, a degree of even secularity. So rather than burn Catholics, drown Baptists, and lock up Methodists for preaching without a license, the people decided that the state should be neutral in religious affairs and consider itself incompetent to adjudicate upon religious disputes. Wolf is allergic to creating a neutral public square or neutral state apparatus. He rejects universal notions of fairness and equality for all. He sees this as a Trojan horse for creating an aggressive secularism disguised as neutrality. But in, in practice, he says it's going to be predatory and coercive. Uh, I would object that that need not be the case, and it normally hasn't been the case. I would point out that you know, in the United States, most religious freedom cases that have come before the Supreme Court usually win, whether we're talking about Hobby Lobby or the Masterpiece Cake Shop. And that was long before the current uh, conservative dominated judiciary on the Supreme Court. Stranger still, Wolf thinks that the First Amendment should only apply to the federal government and not to state governments. Um, so he thinks states should be able to establish their own religion if they wanted to. Now, I find, found this particularly interesting because in Australia, uh, Section 116 of the Constitution is basically a Westminster appropriation of the non-establishment clause and the free exercise clauses of the U.S. First Amendment. But it only applies to the federal government. So in Australia, we have a thing that's like the First Amendment, and it does only apply to the federal government, but that's created all the problems we're having about religious freedom, because at the state levels, they've got all sorts of different ideas about how to ensure religious freedom, how to prevent discrimination and the like. So, you know, only having it apply to the federal government in a, the Australian context has created numerous problems. Um, you're much better, trust me, I can tell you from the Australian ex experience, having a, a law that protects religious freedom from federal, state, and local government. But, you know, besides all that, 
Wolf's dismissal of liberalism, and by liberalism I mean the idea that government should guarantee maximal liberty for its citizens, um, his rejection of that is, is really, again, ironic, because uh, missional Protestantism is what really birthed the liberal tradition, you know, with its emphasis on liberty, freedoms, and rights. You know, if you read uh, Tom Holland's Dominion or James Simpson's book, uh, Permanent Revolution, The Illiberal Roots of Liberalism, uh, they all point out how the liberal political tradition, you know, political freedoms are rooted in missional Protestantism. You know, and that's because the people who set up these frameworks said, look, people have to be free to choose to have a relationship with Christ. So the, the missional Protestant tradition, you have to call it evangelicalism, was always big on religious liberty because every soul should have the freedom to bind itself to Christ and be saved, you know? So we should affirm uh, liberty of conscience in religious matters and with some, with some element of uh, scriptural backing. You know, Paul said, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You know, no one should be cursed in religious matters. Uh, Paul told the Galatians, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So, yeah, Wolf completely dismisses the liberal tradition, and it's a liberal tradition that was created out of missional Protestantism. That's what he doesn't seem to understand. Fifth, Christian nationalism of Wolf's variety leads to a shallow and cultural Christianity. You know, what, what Bonhoeffer called cheap discipleship. Wolf thinks that Christian nationalism makes Christianity plausible, because it socializes people into religious practices in which one hears the gospel and sets the social conditions that aid the reception of the gospel and people coming to faith. Well, to, to a degree, I think that might be true, uh, but there's the problem that people receive just enough Christianity to be inoculated against it. You know, they see Christian values, ethics, beliefs, authority imposed upon them. And that makes them, I think, increasingly resistant to you know, real and authentic Christianity. It becomes a culture of conformity that leads to a superficial and shallow Christianity, which I think in both cases, you know, whether it's imposed or superficial, you know, people are more likely to reject Christianity for those reasons. I mean, from my experience, some of the worst atheists I've met are the products of, you know, Catholic schools where they've got just enough religion and basically to be allergic to it. You know, expectations of mandatory religious conformity are not going to uh, facilitate the free decision to commit one's life to Christ. Quite the reverse. It's, it's going to turn people off it. Uh, it's also possible to argue uh, the opposite of what Wolf says should happen. You know, uh, James Madison um, wrote that the that disestablishment of the church in Virginia was the greatest thing that ever happened to religion there. Piety or you know, religious devotion increased as a direct result. It, it made the clergy sharper, more active, less lazy and indolent. Uh, that observation is bolstered by the sociologist uh, Roger Finke and, and Rodney Stark, who showed that church involvement actually grew stronger in the United States as de-establishment progressed. See their book, The Churching of America. And I have to say, I think Wolf doesn't understand why people celebrate the decline of cultural Christianity in America. But, you know, as I've explained, I think cultural Christianity leads to a shallow and superficial faith. It's a recipe for creating hypocrites, legalists, and atheists. Further, the de-establishment of religion from the state is proven to heighten the depth and the bread of religious devotion when it's done voluntarily. And I also should note something else uh, about Wolf's book. As far as I can tell, there's only one mention of evangelism in the entire book, which means his Christian nation is not achieved by proclamation, but by the power of imposition, okay? So it's not about evangelism. It comes down to power. It's not about persuasion. It's, it's not about come see and taste that the Lord is good. Uh, it's more like the Lord is good. And if you don't say he is, then the Lord's going to get some vengeance on you through us. I mean, that's, that's not a recipe for a good country. Sixth, uh, the expli explicit Americanness of the book is nauseating. 
you know, hey, look, I love America. Uh, America saved our butts in World War II. Uh, I love Chick-fil-A. I've got so many American friends. Um, I do a lot of speaking and writing for Americans. I love it. Uh, but Wolf says stuff that just kind of irk me. He says things like, the American flag implicitly symbolizes the Christian flag. Uh, here I'll say, read my lips. No, it does not. Such remarks would be completely I mean, incomprehensible, I think, to Calvin, Beza, Cranmer, Edwards, Whitfield, almost any reformed person prior to 1776, or maybe even after too. Uh, America is not an elect nation. America is not is not in the Bible, not even in the book of Revelation. America is not the custodian or best version of global or historical Christianity. I mean, I love you people, but don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought. And here I would riff off a little bit of Nicholas Walterstorff. He said, the church is not only American and does not include all Americans. So the church is not American and America is not the church. Now, I'm not going to pontificate too much about American history. Uh, not my monkey, not my circus. I know a little bit, but not a lot. But from what, I, from what I can tell about American history, the attempts to turn America into a Puritan heaven ended up making it Protestant hell, which is why many colonists like Roger Williams of, of Rhode Island and Thomas, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, that's why they argued for the separation of church and state because it was good for the state and it was better for the churches and for the civil and religious freedom of all the people there. Seventh, Wolf argues for the right to revolution, especially when it comes to religion. Uh, he's big on this. He likes his right to revolution. Uh, now, me, I, I, I do believe that Christians can be called to civil and uncivil disobedience. But the Christian tradition has always been very wary very allergic to the notion of regicide, killing the king or, or, or the president. Uh, in, in my reading of you know, the history of political theology, what, one passage that comes up a lot is 1 Samuel 24, where it was noted that David refused to kill Saul even when he had the chance to do so. And uh, even, even John Calvin said it, it was very sanguine at this point. Uh, Calvin said, you know, if you are stuck with a slothful or wicked monarch or prince, pray hard and hope for the best. That was pretty much, pretty much his advice. Uh, it's not really until you get to the English Revolution or the English Civil War and then the American War of Independence and the American Civil War that Protestant interpreters have to start thinking a, 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 of a workaround Romans 13 and Paul's call for Christians to obey civil authority. Uh, now, William Wolfe, I think he, he does believe uh, that Christians should obey governing authority, uh, but he does think that does, there's a point where you have to throw off the shackles of tyranny. Uh, Wolfe, I mean, to his credit here, recognizes that um, Christian rulers um, ha will have true power and then resisting them would be resisting God. And he argues that even non-Christian rulers at the moment have been put in place by God and deserve a certain degree of respect. Be that as it may, it's alarming that Wolf believes revolution is permitted when the government acts in ways detrimental to true religion or when it attacks true religion. Uh, it really de depends on what you mean by detrimental, don't you? You know, sure, banning public worship uh, or banning the preaching of the gospel would be detrimental. Uh, though I don't know whether it would automatically send me into a flight of revolutionary uh, rage, uh, but I, I'd like to try other option verses. Um, I mean, does, does, does the government holding or sponsoring or allowing gay pride parades, does that qualify as being detrimental to true religion? Uh, you know, not, not my thing, uh, but again, it doesn't fill me with revolutionary zeal because I believe citizens in a liberal democracy have to have the freedom to be other than me, you know, They've got to be willing to follow their own conscience. Uh, Wolf is very critical of what he calls regime evangelicals. Um, you know, people who uh, ingratiate themselves to progressive governments by telling them what they, what they want to hear. His own view is that each domain of life, every aspect of private, personal, civic and political life is under God's ordained system of order. And anything that is not that 
he regards as a form of tyranny. And uh, Wolf goes so far as to say that pretty much the, the entire American regime, from Hollywood to health officials to HR departments, for him, that's one big anti-Christian regime. And he says the regime is the tyrant. Though at, at this stage, he seems more interested in resistance than revolution. Uh, finally, we're coming to the end of our summary and critique of the book. Uh, the book ends with a really ranty epilogue. I mean, super ranty uh, epilogue about restoring America to its religious principles. It's a denouncement of the optimism of the Reaganite and Bush modes of conservatism. Uh, it sees the institutions of America as having been secretly taken over by secular subversives and turned into a gynocracy, you know, ruled by soft, effeminate men and their women. Wolf believes that the antidote is not persuasion to a, to a better ideal, to a better nation, but a purge of the whole order itself. Uh, and I think he envisages Trump as merely an instrument for doing that. What is more, um, for Wolf, Putin is kind of a morality tale because he thinks secular progressives would do to Christian nationalists what they are currently doing to Russia, spreading misinformation, punishing it with um, sanctions and all sorts of other punitive actions. And Wolf complains that Christian nationalists are perceived as the Taliban of the West and they are um, a threats to a liberalism and they are perceived as authoritarianism. To which I would say, well, yeah, because you kind of are, and you're sort of like proud of it. So, I mean, they regard us as a, as a type of Taliban, a type of threat to their liberal democracy and their, and their rights and their, their beliefs. But I've read the book, you, you kind of are. What Wolf wants, in his own words, is a, a masculine society because it harmonizes the individual and hierarchy for the common good. To which I would reply, the common good for who? You know, for men and by men who have godlike power over women, which never ends well for, for women. I think Wolf likes the cross, but only when it's painted on a Roman shield or on a Tomahawk cruise missile. Uh, it doesn't dawn on him that the necessity to be in charge doesn't occur to most Christians in most of the world for most of history. I mean, Christians in India don't say this country belongs to us and these Hindus have stolen it. Uh, that's that's not how the book, uh, that's not how the story goes for Christians in other parts of the world. They've got a different way of relating to their culture, to their political landscape. But the idea he wants people to be weaned off a sense of compassion and equality. Um, you know, again, it reminds me of something Hitler said. I want people capable of violence, relentless and cruel. I mean, that, that's that's a quote. Now, again, let me be very clear. Wolf is not a Nazi, but that type of rhetoric be weaned off compassion and gird up your loins to be able to do what must be done to take power. That is sinister. That is some real deep sinister stuff. And then he's got some other weird bits as well. You know, buy a homestead, boys should get blue collar jobs, men should lift weights, make more babies and other things that have quite frankly nothing to do with the New Testament or Christian ethics. If I had to give a final summative verdict about the book, it would be this. It's more like a Christianized version of Nietzsche than the religion of the crucified Nazarene. I could sum up the book with a gloss of one of Nietzsche's famous quotes. I, I would sum up Stephen Wolfe's Christian nationalism this way. Man shall be trained for religious war and the woman for the recreation of the cultural warrior. All else is folly. That in a nutshell is what Stephen Wolfe's The Case for Christian Nationalism is about. And I've tried to list out why I think it's a really bad idea. So in your theological disputes, in your chatting with friends, in your discussions about church-state relationships, I just want you to know this is a bad idea for America, for global Christianity as well. They are, there are much better ways of how church, churches and Christians can relate to the state by this constant need 
to think that they must be in power by any means necessary because it leads you up a dark road and at the end of it you won't find the risen and exalted christ reigning you'll find out i think you've in fact made a faustian pact with the devil himself so that's why i'm not a big fan of christian nationalism and there my friends endeth the lesson Will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest?